I saw something that day, something I'll not forget. It stands 12 feet tall, with razor sharp claws. His hide littered with the weapons of fallen warriors. His face scarred with one dead eye. I drew my sword and... Trump! Dad's leg was clean off. Oh, that's my favorite part. <laughs> In accordance with our laws, the firstborn of each of the great leaders must prove their worth. Merida, stop! A lady enjoys elegant oh. pursuits. I present my only son. He took out a whole armada single-handedly. He was... With one arm, he was steering the ship. Oh. I want my freedom. But are you willing to pay the price your freedom will cost? Careful what you wish for, my mother would say. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah! No more fighting! Show a little decorum! Feast your eyes! <laughs> If you had the chance to change your fate, would you? Tried one of these, it is so good. Man, I can't believe we haven't done this before. Oh, wow, look at that. What a bike. You're aging. Do the jingle. Do the jingle. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Hey, guys. Oh! Uh, do it again. Do it again. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. In my office. State Farm. I think we're good. <laughs> State Farm agents are there when you need them.
Welcome to Turning the Tide with Candace Salina. We're coming at you from the heart of the Rocky Mountains. And today we have a wonderful guest by the name of Simon Toyne. Now, Simon, did I say the last name right? You did. That's perfect. Well done. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Simon is the author of a book called The Key. Now, Simon, your publicist sent me this book and <laughs> I dived into it powered right through it. It is brilliant. She told me that Dan Brown needed to move over because you were in town. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what brought you to writing? Because this is your second book. It was the sequel to The Sanctus, right? That's right. Yes. It's um, it's book two of a trilogy. Um, and um, I sort of, um, it's The Sanctus was my first book, which came out last year. And it was my first book. Um, I didn't know, I kind of wrote it, not even thinking it was going to get published, really, just sort of trying to write something to see if I could write a book. Um, and I had this idea and the idea kept growing. And, um, and I just, uh, I thought, I can't put all of these ideas into one book because it will be this huge book and no one will want to buy it. No one will want to read it. It'll be too big to pick up even. So I split it up into three and then worked on the first one, uh, which was Sanctus. Um, and lo and behold, um, the, uh, it got bought by um, a publisher in the UK and then it got sold in all around the world. And it's been translated into 27 languages now, which is amazing. In fact, it's behind me on the wall there. All of those are copies of Sanctus in various languages. It's not just the same book over and over. I'm not sort of in, insane or anything. Um, <laughs> and so um, uh, the uh, so yeah so I, so Sanctus came out and was a big hit all around the world. Um, and uh, I had all these other ideas. So basically, the key is the second part of this sort of it's sort of a, it's one story, but it splits into three parts. So each book is a standalone. Um, and the idea, I mean, it's sort of, I've always been interested in thrillers and mystery and, um, and the big, and kind of the big questions. Um, and so there is, uh, you, so you mentioned the Dan Brown uh, kind of connection earlier. And it's because at the center of this is a big, the big central question is what if all that we know about the origins of modern Western Christian religion um, are not quite right? And there's an alternative history that's been suppressed over the years and almost eradicated as heresy. Um, but still exists. There's, uh, there, are two, there are a couple of people who still know the truth, um, passed down through the oral tradition, but there are also um, texts um, uh, written down when man first started writing, um, when they first started putting down their thoughts and recording them for the future, um, scratching little symbols on, um, on clay tablets. Um, that if some of these had survived somehow and they tell a sort of true story or a different story of everything right from the back to kind of the, the you know, the creation and the origin of us all. Because, I mean, these are the sort of questions I, I think everyone's interested in them is, you know, it's sort of it, they're the big questions that religion deals with of, you know, who am I? Where are we from? Where are we going to? What is the purpose of it all? How do we fit into the grand scheme of things? And these are all, I mean, religion is an endlessly fascinating subject. Um, and if for writing a thriller and having a mystery, you cannot get a bigger question or a bigger mystery than those. Where do we come from? Where, you know, all those sort of things. So, right. so was, that's what I sort of that's that's kind of the, 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 the kind of tone of the book. I mean, it's a modern thriller. The character is set in the modern day and there are modern characters. The central character in the first book is um, an American female journalist, investigative journal, journalist from New Jersey. Um, the main character in the second book is a sort of uh, is an ex American special forces guy who now works for an international aid agency, sort of going into the dangerous places to help people. Um, but he's involved in this um, this kind of ancient knowledge or this this uh, this move to sort of restore a kind of usurped order. Um, and the third book is about the two of them really. It's sort of book one's about her, book two's about him, three is about how they're joint destinies come together to sort of resolve this big uh kind of mystery revelation to sort of like bring together this uh this alternative history well thank goodness he lives i got to the end of the book and you sent him off into the desert yeah. i was like he did not just kill gabriel <laughs> no, he's, well Gabriel's in a bad way I mean I'm writing the third book now and Ga Gabriel I have to say is in a bad way Gabriel's the hero of the second book and, and in the first book he's sort of pretty heroic as well uh, but he's yeah he's in a bad way let's say that but he's you know he's a tough guy Gabriel and he's very he is yeah and selfless you know he's a good hero he is. I really liked him, you know, and it's really rare these days with authors to make characters that are true heroes. And what I mean by that is is not that they are perfect, 
but that in their flaws, they still keep powering forward, doing what they know is right, regardless of the fear, regardless of the cost, regardless of any weakness they personally may have. They push that aside and move forward. And that's the Gabriel that you created. Well, yeah, I, well, I think they're more interesting. A, they're more interesting, flawed characters. And I think the reason they're more interesting is because they're more real. You know, there is, there is a certain cathartic pleasure in seeing some sort of Superman going and, you know, being invincible and beating up the bad guys. You know, there's something very satisfying about that. Indeed, that's why the Avengers is making so much money. <laughs> no, but it's also, but, it, but I think that's making a lot of money because it ties into lots of things. It ties into notions of um, a kind of global fear and this this idea of a kind of return to sort of those uh, ideas of true good and true evil, black and white, and that sort of stuff. You know, we're living in a world of grey where things are very difficult, are. things complicated, and it's very hard. And so there is something tremendously cathartic and. And, and lovely about going to see a story. I mean, this is, you know, this is the power of stories and this is why stories uh, affect us so much, I think, is because they effectively give you um, an opportunity to, to live out fantasies or live out dangerous experiences that you would never do yourself or never wish to put yourself in those situations yourself, but you can kind of watch them and experience them on a really dramatic and, uh, and real emotional level. And so something like The Avengers is perfect because you would never want to sort of destroy you know, uh, kind of huge cities and all that sort of stuff. And but but seeing it happen on scene is somehow kind of is it makes you feel good. You know, it makes you feel uh, that that somehow you have seen good uh, triumph. And you know, so often in the world, you sort of you get a notion that that good finds it hard to triumph. So um, so it's nice to sort of see it happen in that way. But yeah, but going back to my characters, I sort of i like the flaws and i think the flaws are the things the cracks are the things that make people interesting and make them real and to explore them rather than sort of just not mention them is um is kind of part of the uh the, the pleasure as a writer really and also as a reader you know i'm my first reader so i'm trying to write something that i would want to read uh and so you you know you you never throw anything that you find interesting just because it might be difficult and also it enables you to veer away from cliche because there are so many cliches absolutely out particularly in thrillers, you know, the tough guy, you know, the hard guy, and you just know he's going to go in there at the end and beat everyone up. It's sort of, you know. And, uh, and never run out of bullets, I mean, ever. Never run out of bullets. <laughs> beaten up, and then the next minute they're leaping over a fence. And it's sort of, you know, I mean, like, with all <laughs> characters in my, like, in, there's a character in the second book, The Key, the cop, a, a detective Arcadian, um, who's a, a policeman from um, this the central uh, city of Ruin, which is in Turkey. And at the end of the first book, he gets shot. I mean, he gets shot in the arm and he, he he's in a bad way. And he is in pain pretty much throughout the entire book. You know, his arm's in a sling. He's sort of shuffling around. His wife's giving him a hard time because she's just saying, you've been shot. Just don't, you know. But again, he's a good character who, who knows that these people need his help. And he's the only one really who understands the help they need. So he sort of winces his way through holding his arm and sort of, you know, kind of doing what he can. And, and he's, a, you know, he's a cop, but he's sort of going against, you know, he's sort of, he's, 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 he's kind of going against the law a little bit and not reporting things and helping them out. And there's, you know, there's a conflict there as well. And all of those things are, you know, are just interesting, I think. Well, what was so interesting to me about Detective Arcadian was the fact that that uh, once he recognized that there was corruption, that there was somebody really powerful pulling the strings in the police department and offing people left and right, he stepped up. He he literally stepped up and said, okay, I can't trust anybody. And he ends up trusting only the pathologist, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. And in the first book, there's there's a bond created between those two, and you sort of get a sense that they're... Yeah, they he kind of they've worked with each other a lot, and they kind of know that they're about the case, and they're about getting to the truth. You know, the pathologist is very much about getting to the truth of why people died using his skills, and and Arcadian's uh, the classic detective who sort of you know tries to piece things together and make sense of it all. Um, and he's yeah, he's a noble. But there's there's more backstory in the first uh, book, which kind of explains why he's a little bit of a you know he's not a career high flyer, even though he's clearly a very good detective, because of you know because he's done the right thing rather than the you know the prudent thing he's he's done the right thing rather than the political thing and so he sort of you know he gets the kind of right jobs and never gets the, the kind of glamorous jobs he's but he's a, he's a good reliable pair of hands and um which again makes him interesting i think you know and um there's a there's a story about his wife who appears briefly in the second book about how they met and how she effectively sort of affected his career and um 
And uh, they're, they're, again, they're all the interesting things. It's sort of it's in, because the themes, the, the larger themes of the books are very big and sort of operatic. Um, you know, they're, they're, they are good and evil, and the or, you know the, the timeline is right to the beginning of everything. And the third book goes sort of universal and sort of deals with not just uh, kind of the human history, but kind of universal history as well. Um, it, it's you know they're big themes. And the only way I think you can sort of make those work to a reader is by somehow anchoring them into individual lives and individual um, small, you know, it's the sort of, it's the, it's the contrast between a guy in his job trying to do the right thing, but also struggling against the facts in front of him. You know, that small dilemma that we will all have had, you know, we will all have faced those small dilemmas in our everyday lives but played against this enormous backdrop of kind of world history and everything. So it's, it's you know, it goes from the very small to the very big. And I, but I think the two effectively kind of reflect each other. And each one is, I'm tr- you know, I'm always trying to link them together so that there is, that each is illuminating the other rather than it's just, oh, here's a big thing about that bit. And now back to this little story, you know, like, you know, because otherwise then it becomes a bit soapy. And it's like, meanwhile, back in ruin, you know, and I, I kind of. <laughs> try and keep it all running and going and you know which is it's a big job Someone's yeah got- it, it is someone does have to do it and you have done it very well simon uh, let's talk about the big backdrop the story itself the big mystery the big crisis that is going on and i don't know how much i don't know what you revealed in sanctus this is my first introduction to you and i'm a new big fan by the way yeah it was brilliantly written and a great story yeah. and and you can tell your your history and your experience in television and in in uh, character development and story structure really, really comes out in your books. And it's such a refreshing, refreshing thing to have such well-developed characters and a, and a uh, overriding theme that is so completely described so that it is created in, in three dimension in the reader's mind. So let's talk about that big backdrop there. Your overriding theme, the the uh, Cardinal Clementi. I don't like him. <laughs> he's a, he's a good man gone bad, isn't he? Really, yeah. He's wow. Uh, but he's but I I kind of really you know he's a basically he's a cardinal uh, who in the very inner kind of working the power the executive of uh, Vatican City and uh, he has his main number two. He's number two. Yeah, he's he's basically um, the kind of cardinal secretary of state for Vatican, which effectively makes he's prime minister. Um, so he's kind of a, has all the executive power. I mean, the pope is the kind of figurehead and everything, but he's the well, he's the sort of policymaker. Um, and um, and and he's also in charge of the Vatican Bank. Um, and there's lots. The thing about this, you know, there's lots. You know, I wrote this book a year ago, or you know, getting on for a year ago now. And recently, there's been even more revelations about the Vatican Bank and uh, various kind of misdeeds. I mean, you know, the Vatican Bank not exempt, really. I mean, let's face it, all the banks are, uh, are sort of in the spotlight at the moment for kind of lack of morality. Um, so again, you know, it's for me, it's sort of I, it's topical, and that's good. Um, and uh, so yeah, so he's. But again, I didn't want to make him a sort of twirly, mustachioed kind of, you know, um, a sort of silent movie villain. Um, he's got to be bad, but I want I wanted to, you know, the way I write the books is um, they're all in the third person, uh, but they're very much... Um, each, Thank goodness. They're, yeah, so because it's difficult. Well, well I, it, that was a decision because I knew I wanted uh, a cast of lots of characters. Uh, and I wanted to very much sort of place the reader in their head so that you know how they're feeling, so that you could understand where they're coming from. So, you you know, when you're with that person, you are seeing the world from through their eyes to give you a certain degree of empathy, even with the characters you don't like. You know, this sort of, I want you to kind of understand where they're coming from, really. And he, you know, he does. I mean, he, right early on, he kind of makes a choice and he's sort of vacillating about making this decision, which is an unpleasant decision. But it's sort of he kind of rationalizes it as a well head of state and, you know if I'm head of state then I have to protect the state and I have to sort of occasionally you have to do these things you know sort of like this make sacrifices for the greater good not you know that classic you know thing that all politicians in any sort of executive position would have to do uh, but I put you in his head while he's making that decision and it's a pretty nasty decision he's having to make but he rationalized it as you know the whole church the church that he loves and that is you know God's ministry on earth is at stake. And so surely in order to save that, he's doing God's work. You know, he, he makes that rationale and, uh, um, and you, as I'm hoping reader will be going, he's doing terrible, heinous things and he should not be doing this. And, you know, he's sort of, here's an evil guy doing evil stuff because again, there's no, uh,
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Everywhere I go, I meet people who represent the best of America. They're hopeful, hardworking, determined, and proud. These Americans are quiet heroes. They raise strong families, run our factories, and grow our food. They coach Little League and soccer. They serve on the PTA. They're volunteers, help our neighbors, and they dream big dreams. The vision the values, the character, and the can-do spirit that you find in our small towns have made America great. This is the America known for thriving farms and factories, for prosperous towns and cities, great colleges and universities, for solid communities and churches, all of them born out of American optimism, nourished and sustained by hard work, and a belief that the American future is one of the limitless possibilities and that opportunity is an American birthright. There was a time not so long ago when each of us could walk a little taller and stand a little straighter because we had a gift that no one else in the world shared. We were Americans. It's a celebration of what we have the opportunity to do every day. We knew it without question, and so did the world. It makes me think about all the people that came before me who fought and so that I can have this freedom the spirit that has brought this country together. Those days are coming back. That's our destiny. There's no place in the world that, uh, that I'd like to live other than where I am in America. From now until November, our campaign will carry a simple message. America's greatest days are yet ahead. We're here at the famous Golden Ox Steakhouse in Kansas City where we switched their steaks with Walmart's Choice Premium Steak. This is really good. Like what I grew up with. Only one out of five steaks is good enough to be called Walmart Choice Premium Beef. Can I let you in on a secret? You're eating Walmart steaks. No kidding? No. I promise. It's very tender. You could almost start with a fork. It is delicious. <laughs> we need to start buying those at Walmart. Walmart USDA Choice Premium Steak. Try it. Tell us what you think about it on Facebook. Okay, we are working guarantee. again. Yay. OK. Let me just Everything is good. Stuff off so that it doesn't interfere. We go, we're good. Okay. You're good to go? Yeah, I'm good to go. Okay, we were just getting ready to talk about the overriding theme of writing the story. We had started with Cardinal Clemente, and you had talked about how he was a good man who had to make a hard decision and then eventually became a bad person. But I have to be honest, I don't understand how the man of God could randomly say, hey, kill everybody that survived. <laughs> well, it's funny, because it, it, it's, when I was researching the first book, um, when I, um, I kind of went off to France um, for six months to try and write a book, um, sort of midlife crisis kind of thing. And I was in Cathar country, which is, and the Cathars were right. sort of like prosecuted as in the Albigensian Crusades. And very famously in the, in the course of that, um, during the siege of uh, Béziers, um, the, um, the Catholic bishop of Béziers, who was out, That's when they were going in, uh, they said, how do we know who are heretics and who are uh, real? And he said, kill them all. Uh, God will know uh, which ones were true believers and which were heretics. So it's kind of got you this right. precedent. So. Yes, you're right. It absolutely, there is a precedent. And I, I have to contend that is no man of God <laughs> anyway. So, but what I'm, the thing is, it's, you know, people, this is the part of the, one of the themes of it, you know, is people often do horrendous things in the name of God. You know, we see it now, it's a very topical thing, the whole kind of uh, you know, religious fundamentalism. Um, and it's, um, but it's kind of present in all religions, pretty much, you know, certainly the old religions, the old Abrahamic religions, it's always been present in all of them, of this notion of, you know, what I do may be abhorrent, but I'm doing it in God's name, so it's okay. Um, you know, and it's sort of, it's, it's kind of a theme that runs through history. So, you know, I, was, well, I, I can't I, argue. 
<laughs> no, exactly. It's sort of it's one of those things that I, you know, there are pl there are plenty of kind of leaps of imagination in the book, but I think that's kind of not one of them. You know, that's actually just something that's taken from the historic the historical record. Oh well, yeah, I wasn't saying that it couldn't happen. It didn't happen. I'm just saying, and I I am a student of history, okay. so I know exactly what you're talking about, and. Throughout my study of history, I, 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 I contend throughout history they were not men of God. <laughs> no, well, no, I think that's a good contention as well. But, you know, they, they, they did. They thought they were. And they they did it. They it's so true. Those things, these horrendous things done in the kind of in the name of, um, you know, sort of um, spreading God's word and, um, and, and stamping out the heresy of other, you know, religious thought. And, yes, know. it, it is. Uh, that's what America was founded on. No, absolutely. Then, yeah. Well, lots of history, lots of history kind of twisted on these sort of, you know, the kind of reactions against persecution. We're seeing it now in the Middle East. We are. We are. Absolutely. So speaking of the Middle East, let's talk about the Citadel. Nice segue. Very good. Nice <laughs> uh, play for a professional. Um, the Citadel. Um, yeah, well, uh, the centre of the book is uh, this, um, effectively, it's a monastery, but it's a monastery carved out of this this uh, mountain, this kind of sheer mountain, this vertical, vertiginous mountain, uh, which is at the heart of this, um, it's like a shrine. I imagined it very much like kind of Lourdes or Santiago de Compostela, you know, these places that have got these kind of central, very religious, um, religiously loaded um, uh, uh, kind of edifices. Uh, this whole city of ruin is built around it, so it's an imagined place, and I ima and, and it was an imagined, and it's it's in the foothills of the Taurus Mountains in southern Turkey, uh, and I placed it in southern Turkey because southern so Turkey and that area around Turkey, which I go into in the second book, is part of um, the ancient land of Mesopotamia, which is the land between two rivers, and it's in which now forms a bit of Syria, a lot of Iraq, and bits of southern Turkey. Um, it plays nicely into your legend. Well, it plays nicely into the legend, but it also kind of does a dual job because, uh, it, you know, it's still an interesting place now. But it's a place that very much, uh, you know, the, sort of the great history of it seems to have been in the past. You know, it's prehistory almost. It's kind of pre-Christian history. I mean, it's where, you know, the Mesopotamia is where writing was invented and the first recorded history was put down. And, you know, we have the historical record of that as well. I researched that. I sort of went, you know, the British Museum has lots of it. Um, and so, um, it, and and it's sort of, um, it's all, uh, Turkey's one of those places that, because it's on the edge of Europe and on the edge of the Middle East and on the edge of Asia, it's a crossroads and so much history has swept through it. You know, the Persian Empire, um, uh, the kind of the Byzantine Empire, you know, the sort of the land of Babylon, Babylon and all that sort of stuff, the Babylonian kind of, um, and Assyria, the Assyrian Empire. And, and um, it's... Uh, uh, and of course, and of course, the Ottoman Empire as well. Sort of like to, when Turkey kind of expanded and kind of took over everything, and then was really sort of, in, and then um, it's so kind of like more modern time. So it's it's seen a lot of history, but it's also it's one of those places which, unlike say Rome, is less known. You know, it's sort of if you say Rome, you have an image of of kind of columns and and, uh, and Roman architecture and the whole Roman em empirical thing. Um, Whereas Turkey, I mean, it, Turkey is so old and it's like, it's where, you know, Troy is in Turkey and Antioch is in Turkey. And, um, you know, uh, one of the things that comes into the third book is recently they found the oldest uh, religious temple in Turkey. You know, it's sort of, you know, predates yes. all, you know, but it's, they, they find these things. And it's so, so it's a land that's rich in history, really old history, but it's also in the modern age has kind of been superseded by other civilizations. So... In the, for me, it was the perfect place to set, to place somewhere where an ancient secret that sort of goes right back to the beginning of everything could have been kept and has kind of been forgotten. You know, it's sort of a little bit of a historical backwater now. Um, but there was no real place that existed. I looked for one, but there wasn't one. So in the end, because of the needs of it, and also because I sort of wanted to give it a sort of almost timeless, slightly other uh, feel. I kind of made one up. I invented the place, and it's a, it's a, it's a sort of an amalgam of lots of places I've been to, and it draws on those things like you know Santiago de Compostela and um, all these kind of places of great pilgrimage uh, that have got like you know great res religious resonance, um, and um, so yeah, I created this place uh, for the story to take place in, and I've, I've actually got into a lot of trouble for it because a lot of readers um, give me a hard time and said they googled it because they wanted to go there. And discover that it doesn't exist, and uh, and so you know, it's like, well, well, you know, it's fiction. It, 
Do you know what, Simon? That that means you did your job well. My first book, I created an entire culture in the Andes Mountains. I gave them their tradition, just like you did. I gave them their traditions and their legends and their 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 religion, everything. And I, I got the same response. People went and they're like, that place doesn't exist. That that tribe doesn't exist. I'm like, well, right. You're right. Yeah. It doesn't. Well, so, perfect. yeah. <laughs> I but understand. You did you find cause when I was coming up with the story, I really looked for a place, but it, it was the thing is you realize that no place fits. Exactly. Right. You can either take a real place and take great liberties with it, in which case it sort of feels a bit wrong because then it just feels like you're getting it wrong because people who know it will go, well, that's not right. And you go, whatever. Or you do what you did and what I did and sort of go, well, I'll just create my own place because then you know no one has an issue with it and go but they do you know you, they, they can't say oh, you got that wrong because you go hey i made it up at least i've had people going well no you can't because this place couldn't have done this because of the history of this that and the other and i'm like going yeah but it's you know it's my own made up place oh they go oh, well the um the monastery wouldn't work like that it's like how do you know it's the only place you know i made it up they're heretics they're a heretic that. priest group you yeah. can't say how they would or wouldn't work you made it up Exactly. But although I drew, you know, there have been lots of uh, heretical or perceived to be heretical kind of movements in the past, you know, and they have gone off and sort of it would be the thing you did. You, you would kind of go, well, the thing is that the story is they are not the heretics. You know, they 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 are effectively, you know, it's sort of from our standpoint, you would look at them and think that they are effectively, you know, sort of got it very badly wrong. Um, but um, OK, now I did not read the census, Simon. And see, so what I, I'd like to know is is and I'm going to go get the book and read it but right now for the for the viewers purposes how on earth did a bunch of monks end up in the middle of a mountain living in caves it's all explained in the first book uh, and effects <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Effectively, what it is is well. I mean, if you think of the, the, these places exist, I mean, there's a place called in uh, Greece called Meteora, which is uh, you know, it's it's basically it's a it's a bunch of monks uh, who live in caves, effectively, on this island, on this rocky island, on the Athos Peninsula. You know, it's I didn't, it, you know, they 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 take themselves off and they you know, it's like we want to remove <laughs> ourselves from the world. The whole point of this kind of you know this dedicated monastic way of life is to remove yourself from um, the um, distractions and sinful ways of the world. So you can devote yourself to God. And, and you know, literally in this place, because they're in this elevated, in this mountain, you know, they are physically nearer to God. They see themselves as physically nearer to God. Uh, and the believers, you know, the, the, the historical pilgrims and even the modern pilgrims, you know, believe by coming there and giving tribute to these people who have elevated themselves and cut themselves off from the world, they are, by giving tribute, give, you know, bringing themselves nearer to God. And again, all of this, is not made up this you know people do this and people have done this you know it's still still you know in like um in all in all um religions as well I mean, you can go into kind of eastern faiths and you have these kind of the swamis and the and the you know and the gurus and people kind of go and give them and, and sort of see them and again it's like getting closer if you could get close to a person who's got closer to god then you by extension are getting closer to god um so that's i mean the how they got to be there is they've always effectively they've always been there and and um right from the beginning of time they sort of they they started off and there were natural caves there and they moved in and as and as the uh the, the the kind of monastic order grew they carved out more bits and you know battlements and it became this great fortress because the history of it is that effectively uh, the reason they are um, uh, revered and have historically been revered is because in the mountain are supposedly these relics, these the sac this sacraments, these kind of holy relics um, that were a kind of effectively gifts from the creator. And because they've been there from the beginning, um, the, the divine powers that these things have have given them this influence and this, you know, longevity of life and wisdom. And they collect all these books and have all this collected knowledge. Uh, and, and it's sort of, you know, it's accreted over millennia. Um, and and the notion is that sort of, you know, these guys, uh, when they first moved into these caves and lived longer than everyone else, they did think they were gods, uh, you know, because effectively they, they were like tribal cavemen. And all of a sudden they saw these men of the mountain looking down with long white beards that you know, they'd probably never seen because the average age was about 25 or something. And they go... Look at the behold these people, you know, they must be divine because look, they are living longer and they're living this, you know, sort of life and they're closer to God. And so, you know, that's how the kind of this kind of cut and also the image of God, you know, a, a man up in the sky with a white beard all kind of came. I mean, I'm playing with mythology here, but it's sort of 
you know, uh, it's all explained in in Sat. And the, and the whole notion is they pretty much sort of stayed there, and no one the, the, they kept the secret because anyone who went into the mountain never came, comes out again. Because once you're in and know the secret, you are not allowed to go out. And that's that's effectively, you know, sort of runs through all three books. It does. Now, let me ask: the sacrament. Did you uh, hint or explain in book one what the sacrament was? Because you do reveal what the sacrament is in the key which blew me away and again made me think that those those monks were extremely not men of god <laughs> well except, well that's the yeah no um it was there was a big debate because it, it affects the whole uh the central mystery of the first book is the sacrament what is the sacrament okay. this big right. secret um and so that runs all the way through it um and in the second book in a first draft i i kind of tried not to give it away because i wanted i wanted it to work as a as a standalone so if you hadn't read the first book you could come to the second book and there's enough information there about the characters so that it would just work as a standalone. And I tried not to say what the second was, but in the end I just realized that it was just annoying to someone who hasn't read the first one, effectively referring obliquely to this secret that you in that book never reveal what it is. It's just too irritating. It was actually distracting from the story. So I just figured I'm just going to have to, I'm just going to have to tell you what it is. But just to rem- to get it out of the way of the story as much as anything. Otherwise, it, again, it, it becomes the sort of main thing. And also, I figured if you'd read the first book and you knew what it was, you'd be going, well, why isn't he? We know what it is. We read it in the first book. Why is he just kind of being all this sort of, you know, not being all coy about it? Um, so I just so I just sort of, I don't reveal it straight away. It's kind of referred to. And then it's at a crucial point. It's it's a kind of a reminder effect of you have read it. But um but people have read the key and then gone back to read Sanctus like a prequel, effectively, and they've said it hasn't really affected it because it's not just about finding out what this secret is. You know, there are loads of other stories and you know, all the backstory of the characters that, that you've read about in the in the second book. Um Does the sacrament make an appearance in the third book? Uh well in a sort of in a sense, yes, it does. Um, it's so the third book uh, very much because this because the first book even though the sacrament is revealed um, it's it's not obvious how it is released or what's happened to it in the second book it kind of develops this notion of um, of this kind of transference effectively of the power of it is, is sort of effectively enters a person and either that person gets recaptured uh, and the power is returned to the mountain or it gets back to its original home and kind of, you know, um, things are, are kind of restored. And there's a hint of that in the second in the second one towards the end, you know, the, the way that reveals itself, the way that story pans out. There's a notion of how that works. And so in the third one, that is developed. And so you can kind of get a set. And, and once you read all three, you will, it, hopefully, it will there will be a certain logic to it and you it will kind of like make sense and of course people with the first book of the revelation said well it was great we really liked the surprise but what happened i'm not quite sure what happened and it's like well i didn't want to sort of be that prescriptive about it because well you want to leave as much as you can in the in the mind of the reader you know you, you want them to do the work because they they do a much better job than you do as a writer really you know it's sort of are you going to explain it how it actually happened now, okay here's the thing i was reading the book and loving it and i got to that part and i it, it was what caused me to sink the rest of the way into the story for me yeah because um i i have studied okay i almost i almost <laughs> revealed what the sacrament was i have studied that aspect of history hugely yeah, yeah. and so for me it, it even gave me an added interest in it and then I, you know, I've got to go today and, and buy this thing. Yes, I'm going to do that. I hope I can find it here in town. If not, I'll get it off of Amazon. And, so, and, uh, right now, so you, you know, you can get oh, it or you can get it on Kindle or anything. I can't because I have the key in hardback. And not only am I an author as well, I am a reader as well. And if I start a series, I've got any of the series in hardback. All of them have to be in hardback. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you can get it on uh, Barnes and Noble or something. I still, I've still got it, I think, yeah. so. Yeah, so I'm going to do that, but but uh, I I am fascinated with what you have come up with, Simon. It is such an intriguing story. The key, the the whole premise is so fresh and new. Even though you are borrowing from history, you are borrowing from religion, and and using that to craft your story, which is what any good writer does. You've done it in such a fascinating way that really elevates you to the top. I really, Dan Brown does need to move aside because he is nowhere the writer that you are. 
and I am I am an author myself, Simon, and I am very critical of of other writers. And I have those that I love, and you are one of the ones. Now, now your writings are things that I love because it is so well crafted. And I'm not trying to pander to you no, in any way, shape, form, but I'm trying to help you to understand that what you have done is you are going to have a following second to none. Uh, well, great. That would be lovely. And um, that's a very, you know, I'm <laughs> blushing here. Um, but um, no, it's, it's very gratifying because, you know, you, you, as you know, as a writer, as you work extremely hard to, um, you do a lot of hard work to make it a very easy read. For the you know you do all the work really and um, and kind of kind of get rid of all the stuff that is getting in the way of the story and you really think things through so that you know the world of your story has a very a robust and internal logic so there's no bits where you sort of going what huh you know and and I hate all those with a single bound he was free kind of things uh, that you get in a lot of books you know where you just sort of kind of go. Really? It's like, how did he get out? You know, all of a sudden they produce a gun out of nowhere, and you just sort of going, "No, it's the, he didn't have a gun." And I hate all that. And so you work really hard to sort of make all of it work and make it logical and make the characters interesting and everything. And um, and yeah, and there's a lot of the thing is about this is sort of what I try and do is um, is to hide the research. I do a lot of research, obviously, to sort of give it um, a, a authentic. You know, the, the weird thing is when you're making stuff up, particularly if you're making up a city, and you probably found this as well is you have to do a lot of research of real things in order to make your fabrication seem real, you know, to give it its yes. systems and its, and its kind of mythology. You have to build the mythology from the ground up, and it all has to be, it all has to sort of make sense, you know, it all has to sort of add up, because otherwise the, the reader will just kind of go, you know, readers are very sophisticated, and they can, they can sense a bum note in the same way that if you're listening to an orchestra, you don't necessarily need to be able to play any of the instruments, but you can hear the bum notes. You can hear when it's off or something's, someone's made a mistake. And it's the same in, you know, readers are very sophisticated, and so you have to be, you know, you really have to be on your game, and you, you have to do a lot of research, but I tried very hard to hide the research so it felt like it was just me telling a story that I'd heard rather than making it all up. Um, and, I, you know, the real thing I wanted to do was sort of get to the point where you couldn't tell what was real and what was made up, you know, because there's a lot of real stuff in there. You know, the way the way the monastery works, I research really in detail. And so, you know, the kind of the way that the day is, is split into different devotions is, is all true. And, that you know, the way that a monastery works and the bells and vespers and all the different kind of um, is all sort of taken from from kind of real monastic life. Um, and it's the same with everything. You know, you have to get with the guns right. You have to get the airplanes right. You have to get, you know, if someone takes off from an airport, you have to get the airport right. And, and uh, you know, and, and my main character is a, a New Jersey female investigative journalist. And so you've got to get that right. And, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not from New Jersey. You may have, you may can hear that in my voice. No, so. I didn't guess. <laughs> You know, it's, um, and so all of that, you do a lot of work just so that it just feels like you know uh, you that it all that it just makes sense that it's sort of it's the only way it could be. So it's very gratifying for these, you know when I hear a reader, and particularly a very sophisticated reader who's also a writer herself, um, you say all those very nice things because you know it just makes me feel well. It makes me feel that all the kind of hard work is worth it because that's that's the result you want. You want someone to sort of you know be you know be captured by your story. Well, it paid off. You did a great job, Simon. So I want to tell everyone, go out and buy the key, Simon Toyne. Now, Simon, before we go, I would really like you to uh, tell my viewers a little about yourself. I, your history is quite fascinating. Um, okay, well, I'm from the UK. You can probably hear that. Um, and uh, I, um, for the for about twenty years, the last twenty years, I worked in television, in commercial television, as a writer, a producer, and a director. Um, but before that, I, um, what I really wanted to be was a was a uh, movie director, really, a, a writer, a director. Um, but the films I always liked were the kind of the big, the epic, you know, Close Encounters and um, Raiders of the Lost Ark and Jaws and all these kind of big, epic sort of Godfather sort of you know epic sweep things. Um, and so, but as a first-time writer, uh, I was writing scripts. Um, and you, if you write a script like that, no one's going to give a first-time director um, anything, you know, the budgets to make those. So you end up writing small people talking in a room kind of dramas, which were not necessarily things I wanted to make, but I thought they'd give me a, a toe in. Um, and I made short films, and I sort of, you know, did them on my own and wrote screenplays and tried to get finance for them. And it just, it's really hard to get anything made. And I got close a couple of times. But in the meantime, what happened was, because I had these transferable skills of writing... Simon, 
Can I interject just for a moment? (laughs) That's how I started writing books. I was writing screenplays. I had my own production company. I was trying to get finance. Got close a couple of times. Decided to write a book while I was waiting on one particular deal that was supposed to come through. Ended up writing several books, getting my own rating show, radio show, and moving on. (laughs) But it's funny, isn't it, how these things lead on to it? Because, you know, with the... um... Uh, the discipline of writing screenplays and the kind of notion of having to sort of write effectively what is a blueprint of something. It's all great, but the thing is, it's just the beginning, isn't it? As the writer, it's just the beginning. You then have to cast it and finance it and film it and put it all together and then get a distributor and get it out there and publicize it and all these things. Whereas if you write a book, you are everything. You are, you know, you are the direct, you, you, you stage direct it, you cast it, you write the dialogue, you do everything. And when it's finished, it's finished. You don't have to film it and cast it. It's done. Um, and uh, and, and the, the kind of narrative uh, techniques uh, that you learn in, in, in filmmaking of writing short scenes, and particularly, you know, my book's very short scenes and intercutting, and there's a lot of kind of cinematic techniques or TV techniques as well. Um, it kind of, particularly for sort of three, it really works. You know, those narrative devices really work um, in literature as well, I think. And so it's a really good grounding. And it's funny because um, in the same thing, and you know, I, I kind of veered off into television because of these transferable skills and worked very happily there for nearly 20 years. Um, but I always had this notion of, of wanting to have made the big film. Um, and effectively, when I wrote Sanctus, it was like my blockbuster movie, you know, and it was sort of, I, I, I kind of was having a bit of a midlife crisis of, you know, I didn't. I was kind of slightly bored with television. I was sort of making the same programs over and over again. Creatively, it wasn't very, you know, sort of fulfilling. And I really did think, am I? Can I see myself doing this until retirement, sort of making the same old sort of shows? And, um, and I just thought, I just really need to. I really need to not. I need to give the trying to write something big one last go to either get it out of my system or make it work. And so. Uh, and that was that. So I quit my job and we moved. I moved my family to France for six months, figuring that within six months I could have had a go at something and tried to see if I could, you know, if I could do it. Uh, and if it were, didn't work, then at least we would have had a lovely six months as a family in France, sort of, you know, in the sunshine and all that sort of stuff. And um, and it took me actually. I, I wrote about the first third of the book and came up with the big idea. And um, it took me another year and a bit to finish it, sort of working weekends and holidays and and you know after work and everything. Um, and then another year of rewrites before it got to the point where it sort of went out to publishers. So it was a kind of long old trek. But effectively, it was, you know, I say, this is kind of my, these, these are my movies, effectively. You know, they are, they're kind of cinematic in sort of, um, uh, in, in kind of the way I render them. Um, and, that, you know, and people, a lot of people said, oh, it's very visual, it moves very fast, it feels like a movie, or it feels like something like 24, you know, where you're constantly cutting around and, the story is constantly twisting and you know that's kind of what I was aiming because that's the stuff I like to read you know I kind of well, like and and you did that and you know there's something someone asked me a long time ago I I'm a, a teacher at a lot of writers conferences and and you know instructor and a guest speaker and so on and so forth and and I am always asked why the writers of old would dedicate pages and pages and pages to a single scene or a single picture you know, trying to write it out. We live in a cinematic society, live in a fast food society. If you tried to write a book any other way, Simon, I do not believe today's reader could read it. No, it's funny, isn't it? Um, although if you, you know, you can, you know, like I love Dickens and, and if you, once you, I do too. if you, you know, if you, I mean, Bleak House is one of my favorite books and it's about 1200 pages long and you pick it up and immediately starts and it's like, you know, whole, it's like paragraphs of sentences. And because you're so tuned to this sort of quick cutting, snappy kind of thing, it does take a, a, little, a wee while to sink into it. But then when you do, it's, you know, it's made it's brilliant and um, because the storytelling is still uh, immediate. And the reason I think for that is because he was writing uh, for periodicals, you know, he was, he wasn't writing a 1200 page book. He was writing, uh, you know, a few pages each month that would go in a magazine that people would buy. And he'd have to have a hook at the end because he wanted you to buy it next week because he was a shareholder in the magazines. He was a businessman. You know, he was kind of would sort of probably the first celebrity blockbuster author uh, in the t- in terms that we know them today. Um, and Shakespeare did the same. You know, it was all about, you know, he wrote the best stories he could and he poured everything into it. But it was still about kind of appealing to the groundlings. It was it was still about, you know, we'll have a, we'll have a death here and we'll have a ghost. Here and we'll do, you know, all those same things of twisting the story and keeping, you know, and, and those, the reason, you know, people are still performing Shakespeare and still reading Dickens. And, you know, every year there's another um, uh, version of um, Christmas Carol comes on at Christmas. time. It's because they're just brilliant stories. Well told. This is the thing. 
you know, and 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 the strength of that narrative, the, the sort of fundamental, you know, strong red line of that narrative running through something doesn't change. And the classics are the classics, not only because they're beautifully written and they're, you know, sort of period pieces that you study in school, but, you know, Wuthering Heights is still a brilliant story and Pride and Precious is still a brilliant story. And, you know... One of my favourites. I love Jane Austen. <laughs> but, but I, you see, I, I had this debate with someone recently because they sort of... It was a question. They said, oh, you know, do you object to be called, be called a genre, you know, a thriller writer? And I sort of said, well, I just think either everything's a genre or nothing's a genre. And the way I look at it is everything's a thriller. By definition, you know, you've got to read a book and it's got to excite you, you know, whether it's because you want to know whether the Bennett girls are going to get married or whether it's because you want to know whether the world's going to end. Um, it's or Jack Reacher is going to save everyone from whatever, you know, it's still a thriller. Uh, 1984 is a thriller. You know, it's got suspense. It's got these, you know, it's got all the elements of a thriller. Um, so I think everything's a thriller. And, and, you know, going right back to it, when first storytellers sat behind those around the fires and gathered everyone in, they told thrillers. They told stories about you know, a, a, a fight with a saber-toothed tiger or whatever it was, you know, and all this kind of thing about, you know, of life and struggling against life. And, and again, you know, good triumphing over evil and sort of, you know, a man winning against the elements. All of those stories, you know, they're fundamental to us as a species, I think. And so, you know, I think um, it's sort of, I, so I, I get your point about the fact that it's kind of the language, I think, is something, you know, that people are very um, locked into in a kind of uh, visual age that we live in where you're expecting everything kind of chop and change the sort of narrative pace i think is different but still it I is but but we can say i can say mention eiffel tower in a paragraph and i don't have to describe it not really yeah. but because everyone knows what it looks like 200 years ago not everyone knew what it looked like so it had to be described in detail this this is true. This is true. But um, but I would say that probably in that age was thrilling, you know, because it was like you, you did, in that same way you were like, oh, my God, I can see it. I can imagine all this sort of stuff. And, 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 and you know, I mean, another one of my favorite authors is um, Thomas Hardy and his his book. I mean, he, again, he was writing in periodicals and that same. So he has those hooks. But he goes into pages and pages of description. But it's so beautiful. I mean, he's a poet, he's primarily a pro poet. And it's so beautiful and lyrical that you kind of don't mind. You kind of go with it a bit. Um, and it's it's sort of, you know, it's sort of, um, there's still plot, I think, in the descriptions. There's something, you know, there is, there's, a, there's a attention to detail in it. I think a lot of modern writers, it's almost sort of writing for writers, writing set. It's like the purple prose of I'm now going to go into sort of the endless description of, you know, a line of someone's back. And, and unless you're extremely good and poetic, you know, it sort of comes over as self-indulgent. And, you know, I've read a lot of so-called literary fiction that's just boring. And it, and oh, yes. <laughs> like, I know, look at the beauty in which I'm describing this. I'm just going, I don't need to know exactly, you know, what this vase, you know, I've got the vase. It's a beautiful vase. I've got it. Or what happens to the, you know, what, you know, who's going <laughs> to smash it? Who's, whatever. Who's, I'm thinking who's looking at it. That's the thing. Yeah. You know, Simon, here's the thing is, is uh, we don't get a lot of that in books anymore. We don't get that beautiful prose anymore. And I'll tell you one author that I do read, Nora Roberts. Every once in a while, we'll throw a paragraph in one of her books that actually makes me stop reading and go, wow, that was beautiful. But it is not common. And, and it's kind of sad. It's a sad thing that that has disappeared, that, that ability to describe in such a way that it makes the reader's um, spirit just jump. Does that make sense? You know, yes, absolutely. But um, I think it's sort of, it's still there, though. I think you just, as you say, Nora Roberts is a prime example of someone who's sort of, you know, such, such a kind of like skilled writer. Um, and, but I mean, I, I'm a big fan of John Irving. And I think, you know, he does it mm -hmm. as well. You know, you read he his does. and he absolutely just has these things where you get to the end of the chapter and nothing's really happened. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, you know, he always, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a brilliant constructor of plots as well. And, you mm -hmm. know, but... The, the joy of it. I remember once reading, um, I was the first time I read The Cider House Rules, and there was a chapter in that um, in St. Cloud. And I got to the end of it, and I just laughed out loud because it was so, the construction of this chapter, the way it started, the way it kind of went on this whole thing, and you found something out, whatever, and then it ended, that sort of almost kind of visually there's this device that kind of links it back. I mean, it was just so brilliant that it just made me laugh. You know, it was just like, you know, the kind of, at the, at the just you know almost like a childlike joy of how great just seeing the sort of the you know it's like seeing anyone brilliant do do it you know it's like you you don't need to understand it you just you are aware that you're in the presence of someone who's so I think you know it is it, 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 I know what you mean though but for the sort of 
you know, Dickens managed to, and, and Hardy as well, and all those, you know, managed to be both very commercially successful writers and still have this whole sort of very descriptive thing uh, because um, that was, you know, people were, people had more time. There wasn't TV or radio in those days. Um, and yeah, you have to, the, 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 the job is, is tougher uh, on a modern writer to sort of grab those things. In my years in television, uh, they did some piece of research and they said that, um, they tested people watching TV and then people's viewing habits. And they said that every two minutes, it was pretty much everyone, every two minutes, someone was reaching for a remote. And this is what you had to, uh, you know, to change the channel. So, they, you know, they must know my husband. Well, I think it's a general <laughs> thing. I don't think it's just your husband. Don't hold that against it. But, um, and so effectively, you, that informs you as a writer, when I was making television, that informs your, your narrative structure. You're thinking every two minutes, I've got to engage a viewer. Uh, maybe pay something off, re-engage them with something new. So you're constantly, you know, and so it's pretty, it becomes pretty dense. You know, your 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 narratives and your your um, your hooks and all those sort of devices get kind of condensed. And so in an hour of television, you know, if you're constantly sort of re-hooking every two minutes, that's quite a lot of hooks. Um, oh, yeah, and it's um and it, and it's the same I think in a book. You know, you have to in a in a thriller in particular, you pretty much have to kind of grab and re-grab the reader every couple of pages. You know, because if you're not moving the story on, it just you start getting skipping, and you know, it's the you know, this is the famous Elmore Leonard um, ten tips of writing, and he said basically, you know, when you're writing, cut the bits that you would skip as a reader, and it's like you know, that's that's the thing. It's uh, really that's brilliant. <laughs> that's all you need to know, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And he said, yes, you know, it is. The other one I love of his, he says, if it sounds like writing, I rewrite it, which sort of echoes the thing that we were just saying of getting all the beautiful <laughs> scripted stuff. It's sort of, but. You know. Well, I am excited. I am moving you right up with James Rollins and Steve Barry. So my three favorite writers right now, Simon Doyne, James Rollins, Steve Barry. I just interviewed James on Friday. <laughs> and oh, yeah. so, He's got a new book out. I haven't read it. It's Bloodline, isn't it? His new one. Oh, it's brilliant. Is it good? Yeah, it, it's, it's good. every bit as good as yours. Every bit. He's, well, he's, my, he's published the same. He's, we have the same publisher, so he's a stable. Uh, so, that's yeah. how I found you. Yeah, really. There you go. Good. Yeah, he contacted me, told me about you, and and uh, told me a little bit about the key. And I said, "Oh, absolutely, I must interview this man." So, absolutely. Okay, Simon. Any last things that you would like to say to the Turning the Tide viewers? Uh, I would like to say thank you for listening to me uh, babbling on about my book. Um, You're I, I would like to thank you as well for um, for you know taking because I'm a, you know I'm I'm a relatively new author and so uh, it's very hard to um, sort of you know just get to effectively virtually meet people so so thank you very much for kind of taking uh, a risk because I could have just been some muttering idiot uh, uh, with nothing to say and um, but you did and hopefully you know it's um, it's good I love talking about it it's, yeah, as a writer as you know we spend a, a disproportionately large amount of time alone with our thoughts in our head in a room which is a which is a kind of it's a pretty good working definition of insanity isn't it and uh and so any any kind of any kind of human contact even though it's through skype is um keeps us sane really um that and the children who thankfully have not knock, knocked at the door during the course of this interview but uh, probably will shortly but um so yes yeah, so i'd like to say um uh, thank you all of you and um and i hope you give my books a chance and um and if you do i'm i'm available on facebook and twitter for chats because you know again it's it's good to meet the readers i can have two more friends on facebook simon i will come find you <laughs> Okay, okay. So you, so you're 4,998. <laughs> oh, well, I'm going to be your 5,000. I'm going to find you, and I'm going to make sure I'm going to get in on, under the wire. Good, good. Well, Simon, I want to, every time you have a new book out, I want to interview you. Okay. I, I, will, I, I don't I'll, want to lose this connection. You are a fabulous writer, and I think you have a lot to offer the world today because we are a world in chaos. There's just There's no denying it. Every nation everywhere is suffering economic woes, government woes, every kind of things going on. And when writers can jump into a book for a few hours and get away and the good guys win, even at a great cost, that is a price beyond measure that you can give the world. And that's what you've done, Simon. Thank you very much. It was very sweet. You are so welcome. And I mean it from my heart. You have a great day and we will connect on Facebook. Okay. Indeed, I'm going there now, right now. Great. Thanks, Simon. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
How did you get out there? Fire escape. It's 20 stories. The doorman's intimidating. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Mr. Parker. Not much to tell, really. Peter lives with his aunt and uncle. Did you catch that spider guy yet? No, but we will. This guy wears a mask like an outlaw. I think he's trying to do something maybe the police can't. Can't? <laughs> <clears throat> you know, if you're gonna steal cars, don't dress like a car thief. You a cop? You seriously think I'm a cop? In a skin tie, red and blue suit. Who are you? I know it's been rough for you, Peter. <laughs> I forgot all about that thing. It was your dad's. Your father was a very secretive man, Peter. Dr. Connors. I'm Richard Parker's son. Your father and I were going to change the lives of millions, including mine. Extraordinary. How did you come up with this? There's a rumor of a new species in New York. It can be aggressive if threatened. I gotta stop him, because I created him. of New York's finest versus one guy in a unitard. Whoa! If you want the truth, Peter, come and get it. I am issuing an arrest warrant for the masked vigilante known as Spider-Man. Oh, I'm in trouble.